I think that there is a kind of amnesia with respect to the historical accomplishments of African-American women. She's probably the most famous African-American pre-Civil War historical figure in the world. It's a saying, Bethune went from the outhouse to the White House. No one could seem to tell a story with the vividness of Elizabeth Proctor Thomas. Mary Church Terrell was a stalwart in Washington, D.C. history. And the thing that brought these founding mothers together was their thirst for education. For far too long, they toiled in the shadow of men. Maybe you know their names. Mary Church Terrell, Mary McLeod Bethune, Elizabeth Proctor Thomas, Harriet Tubman. But what did they do to change the course of black history? And why should we remember them? Founding mothers will look at their lives and their accomplishments. Once the center of DC's black culture, we'll see if Mary Church Terrell's home can be saved. Today, her house is boarded up. It looks dilapidated. Then we'll meet an actress who keeps the spirit of Elizabeth Proctor Thomas alive. And they just came in one day and took axes and shovels and whatever, and they tore up my house. And we'll tour the house where Mary McLeod Bethune turned mild-mannered ladies into political activists. But we start with perhaps our best known founding mother. Here on the CNO Canal, slaves followed it up north to escape to freedom. Over on Maryland's eastern shore, a young slave led the way to become the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. You may think you know all about Harriet Tubman, but you don't. You think you know this woman. You know she's associated with the Underground Railroad. And after that, you know nothing. And we walk as fast as we can along the riverbank. Now don't nobody talk with me. Don't draw these kids, because we're going to make it out of here. For many of us, this 1970s made-for-TV movie, A Woman Called Moses, formed our impressions of Tubman. It's a period piece. I would expect that we would study it for myth-making. It's a moment in time. This is where the legending of Tubman was at that moment. Until the 21st century, you could count the number of books about Tubman on one hand. But the past few years have seen a resurgence in biographies about her. Most of all, they help correct some of the myths about this remarkable woman. The image that we have of Tubman is of this daring woman who defies all and gets people out of slavery, probably on foot with a rifle, which she never carries. She carries a pistol. Until the most recent research, propaganda put forward by 19th century abolitionists has been passed on in popular culture, like the number of people Tubman led to freedom. The number of people, it's always been 400. I think she's up around 70 people. So she's bringing people, her loved ones, out of slavery, but her legend has grown to permeate the entire South. She was only in Maryland. Out on Maryland's eastern shore, you can retrace Tubman's journeys on the 125-mile byway that bears her name. Along the way, you find safe havens where she found shelter and maybe some solace. Her 13 trips to freedom began here. The eastern shore, of course, has lowlands and swamps. It has um, internal pathways, all of which Tubman would have known very well. So she would have really had a lot of geographic self-confidence, unlike most women who were more homebound and didn't have a large geographic range.
But geography was hardly her only challenge. Physical dangers were everywhere. There are slave catchers, bounty hunters. There are people who are putting out rewards. Just the danger of death. And then there's always just the specter of being returned to slavery. She defies all of the people who come after her. They never capture this woman. And once the Civil War was over, Tubman didn't just hang up her pistol and retire. Her work after the Underground Railroad continues in its humanitarian cause. She's run the John Brown Home, a senior citizen's place, a place for people who are indigent, a place for people who are invalids. She's taking care of them. In spring of 2013, the state of Maryland broke ground on the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park near Cambridge to honor the courageous conductor. There was a tremendous spirit of Harriet Tubman here in this place on, on this uh, beautiful sunny day on the Eastern Shore. If you think about the constraints that were running her life, that she had to overcome to do what she did, then you begin to really understand that this is a magnificent woman. Up next on Founding Mothers, Elizabeth Proctor Thomas. And they just came in one day and took axes and shovels and whatever, and they tore up my house. Took all day, they tore my house down. Oh. Donise Stevens has been portraying Elizabeth Proctor Thomas, a woman who gave up her home for the Union cause for 13 years now. It enlightened and uplifted everyone who heard her story, and over the years has had a profound effect on me also. To get ready for her performance, Stevens gets into character by removing her makeup. I feel that it's important to be able to convey the story with my face. Mrs. Thomas lived to be a ripe old age, and I'm somewhere in the middle, so I feel comfortable in my own skin. We researched and produced a costume for Mrs. Thomas. And after that, it became more real to people to see her in the colonial garb. The real life drama of Elizabeth Proctor Thomas would happen here at what is now Fort Stevens. It was the scene of one of the war's most dramatic battles. The soldiers here are credited for saving the city, but it never could have happened without founding mother, Elizabeth Proctor Thomas. Had the wall, somebody put their hand on my shoulder. First, I didn't even pay no attention. Donnie Stevens so enacts a pivotal sad. scene in our nation's history, you know a meeting between President Lincoln and Mrs. Thomas. When I looked around, I looked up in the eyes and said it's mine. Elizabeth Proctor Thomas owned the property that became Fort Stevens. Before it was a battleground, it was her home and farm. When the war broke out, her land's higher elevation and proximity to the Maryland border made it strategically important. I was sitting on the sycamore tree used to shade my house, holding on to my baby, six months old. Abraham Lincoln, a man in black, tall and thin, came and walked up to her. Face white as a ghost. <laughs> no white to those eyes, they were all streaked with red from all night watching or crying or maybe the smoke from them big guns. He said to me, I'm sorry that I had to give the order to have your house torn down. But you see, our nation's in danger and your sacrifice might save her. I promise you that you will be rewarded greatly. Thomas also told of saving Lincoln's life when his lanky frame made him a sniper's target. 
She says she was there the day that Abraham Lincoln was shot and that it was her who actually said, get down, you damned fool. Despite Lincoln's promised reward once the war was over, none ever came. She got her land back, most of it. There was actually a bill to pay reparations. There's no clear record on whether or not she received it except her own word, and she said she didn't. I can still see those sad eyes looking down at me. Some folks say no, but I believe had he lived, he would have made good his promise. She lived 96 years and was revered in her community of Brightwood and was a civic leader, constantly involved in the efforts trying to get better education for the kids, trying to get better schools built, trying to get better facilities for everyone in the community. There is a photograph that you see of her, the only woman, number one, and the only African-American photographed in 1911 at Fort Stevens where the Civil War veteran commemorated that moment with Abraham Lincoln in 1864, which is another clear sign of the respect that they had for her. All these years later, you can now see her name on the street directly in front of Fort Stevens. So now forever she is connected to her land and I think that's remarkable. Did the government send you to give me my money? People from all over the world, literally, saw this little old lady's story and were so touched because it resonated with people that every person ha can have a part in making things better. I'm excited that her name has been kept alive. Coming up on Founding Mothers, Mary Church Terrell. Unlike our other founding mothers, Mary Church Terrell grew up in an elite family. Her father was often called the first black millionaire. Despite her advantages, she pursued her education with a passion. She is one of the women that finds herself in a magic class of up and coming women of mark in Oberlin in 1884. And these women are going to change the history of the African American community in the years after they graduate. LaJoy Park was once the hub for black intelligentsia. Mary Church moved here to Washington for a teaching job and soon married Robert Terrell, who would later become Washington's first black judge. Their home later became the center for black culture in the capital city. A high school principal, she would be appointed to the D.C. School Board in 1895, a first for a black woman in the United States. The next year, she became the first president of the National Association of Colored Women. The Black Women's Club movement may be, I think, characterized as an outspoken need for black women to do for self. And the NACWC sought to become these living mirrors through which other African American women could seem to model themselves after. In 1913, when the Women's Suffrage March came to Washington, D.C., Mary Church Terrell and a group of Howard University students participated in that march in the Jim Crow section of the parade. She showed, particularly in the 1950s, how she was still willing, at an advanced age, to confront Jim Crow in the capital city directly. They had laws barring, essentially, public segregation uh, in the District of Columbia had been passed in the 1870s. And she wanted to test the laws that had been conveniently forgotten. So she started a sit-in and caused a law case over it. That went all the way to the Supreme Court and in 1953, overnight, the Supreme Court desegregated Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was because of her. Eric Fiddler thinks a lot about Mary Church Terrell's legacy. Every year, he leads a tour through LaJoy Park and the Terrell House. Now a National Historic Site, it's a popular stop. 
Her house is really interesting because it's probably one of the few houses in the neighborhood that is in poor physical condition. It's a little bit unusual because it looks as though half of the house is missing. The other half of the house, it was originally built as a duplex burned down. Neighbors call it the half house, but many hope it can come to honor Mary Church Terrell and keep the memory of her accomplishments alive. There has been an effort to restore the house and turn it into a museum dedicated to the neighborhood and to her life. In the recent past, security at the house has become a real problem. People have sometimes fallen asleep on the lawn or tried to move in. The problem is that the house is vacant and neglected, so it becomes a target for that. We, of course, would like it to be restored as soon as possible. They want us to fix it up and actually put it to the use for which it was intended. You don't want a house in the middle of a revitalizing neighborhood to be surrounded with a construction fence all of this time. From the outside, while it's looking a lot better than it was, everyone is looking forward to its complete restoration. Restoring the home has a hefty price tag. Five years ago, it was quoted at nearly $2 million. Plans to return it to its original duplex and open one half as a bed and breakfast was rejected by neighbors. Mary Church Terrell and her husband, they were leaders in the community in civic work. And I think it would be wonderful for them to be honored in that way. When we come back on Founding Mothers, Mary McLeod Bethune. It's amazing to hear how Mary McLeod Bethune's words still resonate 60 years after her death. Born on a cotton farm in South Carolina, she was the 15th of 17 children. The only one in her family to go to school, she would walk eight miles back and forth every day. Later, with a dollar and 50 cents, she founded the Literacy and Industrial Training School for Negro Girls in Daytona, Florida. Today, Bethune-Cookman College offers advanced degrees. For many people, that would be a life's work. But for founding mother Mary McLeod Bethune, it was just a start. By the 1930s, Mary McLeod Bethune was a frequent visitor to Washington, D.C. A well-respected educator, she had already worked with Presidents Coolidge and Hoover. It's a saying, Bethune went from the outhouse to the White House. During the Roosevelt administration, her close ties with Mrs. Roosevelt and her work with the Federal Council of Negro Affairs led to her appointment to FDR's unofficial black cabinet. President Roosevelt assembled a group of top African-American civil rights leaders informally to, to provide advice and direction on how to handle a problem that spilled into every sphere of American life. There were communities that didn't have running water, paved streets, sewage treatment systems, and things of that nature in their neighborhood. So they were the last ones to get federal tax dollars into their community. And so Mrs. Bethune said, President Roosevelt, the tax dollars are not getting to these communities. And she said, didn't you campaign in your speech that you're for the ordinary common person on the street? And so that's how she appealed to the president to say, this needs to happen. The impact of his black advisors uh, made him more sensitive to what was going on with 10% of the nation. Although she had served as its president a decade earlier, by 1935, Bethune wanted to push the boundaries of the National Association of Colored Women. So she founded the National Council of Negro Women with a more activist agenda in mind. 
she said it kept weighing on her mind how America devalued black women and she wanted to do something about it, that it was time to make that paradigm shift from being a benevolent organization to being lobbyist. They hammered out plans of how to bring about social changes here in America and they would come together to make a difference. In the early 1940s, the National Council would purchase this Washington row house to serve as its headquarters. Today, it is owned by the National Park Service. Bethune set up her office here and held many key strategy meetings in this conference room. You will see the room at the top of the stairs on the second floor, which she did use as her bedroom as she would travel back and forth. Today, the Park Service mission is to educate the public about Mrs. Bethune and her accomplishments. And I've had teachers to come and they say, oh my God, I had no clue. We have not heard about Mary McLeod Bethune. So we have a tall order here at this Park Service site. Still, Park Ranger Miles doesn't worry that Bethune will be forgotten. If I think of her legacy, it's a legacy of love. Teaching people how to get along with one another. Here in Washington, we have a statue erected to Bethune. She's passing on like a scroll onto the children, and that's her legacy that she's passing on to them. It has the final lines from her last will and testament, and it reveals her optimism for the future and her undying work on behalf of making the United States a place that lived up to the lofty words of its public creed. You can see Mary McLeod Bethune's statue here in DC's Lincoln Park. It was dedicated by the National Council of Negro Women in 1974. In our brief half hour, we've only sketched the lives of our founding mothers. If you want to learn more about their amazing accomplishments, go to our website, dcw50.com. I'm Robin Hamilton. Thanks for watching.